good morning. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm trained as a pediatric hematologist, and I'm very interested in what causes MPN. I can see all of you are um, extremely um, passionate about more research being done in the area to help us learn how patients will do to help us keep all of our children healthy. And that's completely my goal as well. So I'm, I'm glad that you're all here. I really appreciate the questions you have. And I'm looking forward to sharing our work with you and sharing our experience with you and trying to answer any other questions you may have. Because we all have the same passion and the same goal. We want to keep all children with MPN healthy, and we want them to grow up into healthy adults with MPN. So at Hopkins, we have had an MPN program for many, many years, longer than I was there, longer than when I was even born. And so we really have a huge experience. And we've been collecting our patient data you know, for decades. And so we have follow up on some pediatric patients for over 50 years. And the good news is our pediatric patients are doing beautifully. And so our goal is to try and understand you know, what what disease manifestations are specific to our young patients and how we can manage them to keep them as healthy as um, possible. So I'm gonna start out with um, one of my patients um, who I think beautifully exemplifies how state-of-the-art therapy can keep our patients very healthy. Um, so Josh, um, I met when he was 17, um, and he was attending college. His mom and dad went to pick him up for winter break, and they noticed he was yellow. So this was his first presentation of an MPN. They took him to his primary care doctor. I believe he was still seeing a pediatrician at that time. And the pediatrician noted that he had anemia. He also had a very large liver and spleen, and he had inflammation of the liver, something we also know as hepatitis. So they evaluated him for potential infections. Of course, I think um, many of you probably know that you can get hepatitis from seafood or from viruses. They looked for toxins. Could he have gotten into something that causes liver inflammation? You know, sometimes even excessive um, Tylenol or alcohol, of course, can cause liver inflammation. They checked him for something that might be inflaming his liver. Um, and he was sent to Hopkins initially to our GI department um, to look into his liver more carefully because that was really one of the um, salient features when he presented. So they went ahead to try to do a biopsy, but as they were advancing the um, the special tube to take a piece of the liver and study it, they kind of came up against a, a blockage. And so they thought there may be a clot there. And in fact, you know, they weren't able to get the biopsy at that time. They diagnosed a clot with imaging studies, and I think you all know that clots can be um, complications, and you just heard um, from a very articulate patient how um, she was confronted with this, and I'm so thrilled to see how well you're doing. You're very inspirational to all of us. Um, so then the liver biopsy was performed on uh, Josh, and it showed some scarring, um, and we, because of that clot in the liver blood vessels, we're very concerned about myeloproliferative neoplasias. Because what we've noticed from many of our patients at Hopkins, younger patients, usually in their 20s or 30s, are the patients who are most frequently having this complication. Um, and so we, and what's very, um, was perplexing about Josh, I think, to some of the doctors, and was um, somewhat unusual even for our patients where we um, have seen lots and lots of MPN patients, he was actually anemic. Um, and so we did a red cell mass, which is a very specialized test to see how many red cells are there. Um, and we looked for a JAK mutation. And he was both, he had the JAK mutation, which I think many of you know is one of the most common mutations associated with MPN. It's an acquired mutation. And one thing that's, um, I think, particularly interesting about this mutation that was recently learned in the last few years is that it's also a common mutation acquired with aging. So as people age and get to their 60s, our um, stem cells are picking up mutations at a regular rate from the time we're born um, for as long as we live. And this is actually a pretty common mutation that's acquired in, in older adults as they age. And in fact, people over 60, about 10 or 15% of all people will have a mutation that causes something called clonal hematopoiesis 
which means that your blood stem cells, these are your parent cells that make blood, are overactive. And that's what happens in MPN, as you know. So the, you might still be wondering, well, how is this patient anemic? He had MPNs. Well, it turns out that because of the clot in his liver, his spleen was really, really large. And your spleen is sort of like a sponge. It can hold a large volume of blood. So he had too much blood um, you know, overall in his body, but it was pooled in his spleen. And so he was a very um, challenging patient to diagnose, um, not only because he was very young, and as you know, most pediatricians aren't familiar with this diagnosis, but also because even for an MPN patient um, with a relatively common complication, the clot, he had a low hemoglobin. Um, so let me continue with Josh's story because it has a very happy ending. So he was originally treated with phlebotomy after we met him, um, and this did lead to some improvement in his symptoms. He felt a little bit fatigued. He had some headaches. Um, but the problem was the liver had quite a bit of scarring, as you heard from the biopsy, and his liver function was gradually um, declining so that he was developing the inability for his blood to clot because you may know that many of the proteins that help our blood clot are made in the liver, and he was also developing something that we call a hepatic encephalopathy. He was getting really groggy and sleepy because our livers are important organs that detoxify our bodies, and some of these um, toxins, ammonia for instance, was building up and making him sleepy. So he underwent a liver transplant from his father, and um, both he and his father are doing wonderfully. Um, after the liver transplant, we continued some phlebotomy. And for those of you with PB or those of you with family members with PB, um, probably know when you undergo phlebotomy, not only do you take off blood, which of course helps our patients because we want it to be at a lower level so it's not you know, causing symptoms, um, but it can cause iron deficiency, because every time we take off blood, we're also taking off iron. And iron deficiency can make you feel bad, even if your hemoglobin is not low. It can make you feel a little bit tired and have a little trouble focusing. And Josh had those kinds of symptoms with, um, with his iron deficiency, even though we were maintaining his hemoglobin in a normal range. So we started him on pegylated interferon, and he um, took that and tolerated it pretty well. And fortunately, it's the newer version, and I I'm thrilled to say that I've never actually had to treat a patient with the older version. It sounds like the newer one is much better. So he did pretty well with it. But remember, he had a liver transplant. We're following his liver very carefully, checking his liver enzymes. And he started to get the inflammation coming back in the liver. So when someone's had a liver transplant and if their liver tests are starting to become abnormal, it's thought that maybe they're having a rejection of the transplant. His was not being rejected. That was ruled out. They got a repeat biopsy. Um, and another Another side effect of interferon can be liver inflammation. So after they got the biopsy and showed it did not have any evidence of rejection, we stopped the interferon and everything normalized. So Josh cannot um, get interferon. It's fairly unusual. Most of our patients who get interferon with um, MPNs do very well and don't develop this. Um, so. Um, we then went back to phlebotomy, and Josh is back in college. As you might imagine, he had to take a little break when he was first diagnosed and went through the liver transplant, but he was a, a champ, a real champ. Um, and now, since he's off of the um, interferon and getting phlebotomy, we opted to start him on the JAK inhibitor that you probably have heard a little bit about, and he is doing beautifully. So his iron levels are creeping back up into a normal range. He's focusing. He's back in college, he's studying computers, um, and really doing beautifully. And he's no longer iron deficient. Um, and um, as I mentioned, he's completing college. And he and his dad, I think this whole process was really a very special bonding experience for them. And they both um, recently learned how to scuba dive. They got their scuba diving license. And whenever they can, they go scuba diving together. So he's a real success story. And this is what, you know, how we want to keep all of our patients healthy so that they can do the things that they want to do. And of course, we would like to prevent um, you know, things like clots that cause you to have to get a liver transplant. So that's why I think it's really important for us to collaborate with our friends. Um, uh, Nicole and I met at one of the society meetings for hematology that she told you about, and we're teaming together with everyone in the country to try to gather all the data on these young people. So for Josh, wouldn't it have been nice to know that he had this problem? We could have treated him before the clot and potentially have prevented it. So that's what we're after. Um, 
And so why did this happen to, ja to Josh? I wanted to um, just show you the pathway. Some of you may already know this, but um, we have signaling pathways in our blood stem cells. And our blood stem cells are sort of our parent blood cells. They're making all of the other cells that circulate in our body. And you probably know that our red cells, they only last about 120 days. So our stem cells are very highly pro proliferative. They have to work hard from the day you're born till about, you know, 100 years if we live that long. So they have special molecules that tell them to make more blood, tell them to make red cells, white cells, and platelets. And when someone has the JAK mutation, or even patients who don't have a JAK mutation, some of the other mutations give rise to hyperactive signaling. So this pathway is sort of cranked up. And that's why we see the symptoms that we see, too much blood. Um, and what often happens is when you have one of these mutant genes, the level, the number of stem cells um, with the mutation increases. We call that allele burden. So you acquire higher levels of the mutant gene over time if you're an older adult. So I'm going to show you some of our data on younger children um, and young adults, and they're not getting an increase in allele burden like we see in our older patients. So I think that's really encouraging. Um, but even when you have um, lower what we call allele burdens or levels of the mutant gene, you have this hyperactive signaling. And what we're trying to do is prevent symptoms from it and prevent it from progressing, progressing to myelofibrosis or leukemia. And so at our program, we have um, a very strong interest in clinically what's happening to patients. And some of you may have heard from Dr. Molitano yesterday. Um, she's been following the older adult patients for a very long time, and she's been following a number of young women over the years as well. And she's a wonderful colleague. She's been teaching me about adults with MPN, and I've been teaching her about children. And we put our heads together, because as you know, this is rare. And I was just thrilled to meet um, Nicole last year, because it's great to have other colleagues who are interested in the same problem and we can share our experience and advance the field and help other doctors to care for you. Um, so I just wanted to show you this because this is the medication that Josh was recently started on and that puts the brakes on that mutant protein and remember that mutant protein is sort of like a blood stem cell that has um, the foot on the um, accelerator all the way down. It kind of lifts it off the accelerator a little bit and slows up the blood cell production. And as I mentioned, he is doing beautifully on it. He feels great, his iron levels are climbing, and um, he really has no symptoms whatsoever. And he's also doing very well from a liver transplant point of view. And one of the things um, Nicole mentioned is, as we follow these patients, we're really a team. So of course he has gastro neurologists who follow him closely, making sure that his he maintains this liver transplant that he's gotten, that the liver stays healthy. Um, and so it's very much a team approach. And he lives, oh, maybe 40 miles or so away from Hopkins, our hospital. So very often when he was on phlebotomy, he would get it through his local doctor. And he had a doctor, most often my experience with the um, primary doctors, the pediatricians, or in some cases the internists for our young adults, they welcome our advice, you know, because they know this is rare. And, and most of um, our doctors are doctors because they want to help the patients feel better. So, you know, I guess if some of you have, it sounds like some of you have had some bad experiences, and I'm really sorry to hear that, because really what you want is your physician to be on your team to help your child stay healthy. Um, and so this was really a nice story of how a patient with a lot of complications can really do beautifully. And it's very much been teamwork. So let me share with you this cohort that I've told you about. Um, we have actually 630 patients who have been enrolled. And some of these patients were diagnosed 50 or so years ago. Um, the cohort from whom we've drawn blood and we're looking, some of you asked, what about other genes? Well, we're actively searching for that. Both Nicole and I and a number of our colleagues around the country are doing very sophisticated molecular technology on our patients' blood cells to figure out, OK, we know they have this mutation or they don't. What else is going on? How do our children differ from the adults. We're, we're using the absolute latest technology to look 
at the molecules in the genes and find out you know, what else is going on, what happens when the disease changes, and how we can keep the cells in the patients as healthy as possible. So with our cohort of 630 patients, um, our focus, as I just alluded to, is to look at the you know, genomic lesions, what else happens to these blood cells, to look at the clinical presentation. I just told you about Josh, who really had a very um, dramatic presentation. And then to look at how our patients are doing, because what we really want to do is keep you healthy. And so we want to find out, okay, what do we do for this patient who's been healthy for 70 years? Um, how, how does that help us um, ensure that all of our patients can be healthy until 70 years? Um, and so we've also put together a database, and I think if you heard Dr. Molotano Allison yesterday, she's been really heading up this um, database and um, this program. Um, and I was just recently brought on in the last several years to take care of the children and young adults. Um, so it's really been a wonderful collaborative experience. Um, so we, every, um, twice a year rather, semi-annually, we collect data on our patients. Um, you know, we have some patients who are 70, 80, 90 years old. So, you know, we find out how long they're living, how they're doing, what's happened with their disease, what are their complications. Um, we try to characterize their gene mutation, just like all of you. Um, when you've seen your doctor, they've checked for JAK2 mutations, which are the most common. They check for CalR, they check for MIPL, um, and probably that list will increase over time as um, Nicole and many of our colleagues and myself look deeper at these cells to find out what's going on. We want to find the best ways to make the diagnosis and the best ways to manage our patients. So we actually have um, 5,000 patient years of experience and observation with this cohort. And we have a fair number of pediatric patients. And for actually the purposes of our talk today, we're considering pediatric and young adult patients to be um, 30 and below. But interestingly, um, in patients with a common form of childhood leukemia, and in, I think this will be translatable to our myeloproliferative neoplasia patients, we're finding that actually patients who are 40 and below are more like children than they are like older adults. And that means in terms of how their blood stem cells behave, what other kinds of mutations their blood stem cells may have. So um, I think when we put this data together and submit it, we're going to go with 40 and below because at least from the leukemia literature, we're finding that um, young adults who are in their 30s do better when they're treated with pediatric um, therapy. And so what, do our, what does our cohort look like? And actually, we have a few more patients since this um, slide was put together. But you can see we have over 80 um, children and young adults with myeloproliferative neoplasias who've been followed over the years. And just like you heard about, um, if you were here yesterday from Allison, most adult patients, we call them non-PIA, so PIA, pediatric, and young adults, um, most of the um, PIA patients are also girls or young women, um, similar to the older adults with MPNs. They tend to have a female predominance, but the female predominance is a little bit more in our young patients. Um, what is their um, median age at diagnosis? So that means what's the most common age that we see our young adults? Well, we've had babies diagnosed. We have a family that um, carries the MIPL mutation, and so um, we were able to diagnose with the a baby within the first week of life because we were expecting it and looking for it. Um, but the average age of our young adult um, cohort is about 25. And the average age of older patients who get diagnosed is in their 50s, as you can see there. Um, and um, I think one of the things that I feel very privileged to be part of this program is we have a lot of follow-up on these young patients. In fact, we have longer follow-up on our young patients than we do on our older patients. So we have 12 years on average follow-up, but look at that, zero to 54 years. So that means that patient was diagnosed quite some time ago. Um, and all of you are very interested in, well, what's causing this? What's the gene? What do we look for? Um, and so. Um, as we've discussed a little bit earlier, and you've heard over the last couple of days, we look for JAK2 mutations, since that's the most common lesion that's associated with MPN. There's another mutation in a different um, location in this gene that we also look for. Um, CalR um, was discovered in the last decade as causing ET and myelofibrosis, so we look for that. And, and actually, at Hopkins, um, a cohort of 
family cohort was described with the MIPL mutation. So we also look for that. And then as you heard, many children have not a single lesion in one of those genes, and we call them triple negative. And we're hoping to shed some light on that triple negative by doing very deep investigations of our patient's um, blood cells to try to figure out what else is causing that. And I know that you all want to know that. Um, because what that could allow us to do is to say, well, this is your lesion, this is what we expect, and this is the best treatment. That's really what we're going after. And you can see the distribution of these different um, mutations in children versus adults is pretty similar, although on average children tend to be more of what we call the triple negative. And then if we look at how, what kinds of phenotypes, um, our, most children who present have high platelets, something we call ET, or essential thrombocytosis, which you heard about. Um, the, and that's also true in the older patients, although it's less of a predominance. It's more common in children. Um, and that's actually good news, because of, patients with ET tend to do really, really well. Um, PV is the second most common, and again, that's good news, because PV tends to be relatively mild and tends to... Um, not progress rapidly and cause problems with the bone marrow. So we have more ET, the second is PV, and then rarely we see some myelofibrosis. And if you look at the older patients, they tend to have more myelofibrosis. And interestingly, when you look at the older patients, those who have myelofibrosis tend to be more males. And again, um, we have really extensive follow-up on these pediatric patients, as I mentioned before. So this is how their age distribution looks. I mentioned the, the very young baby we diagnosed. We've had a few other children under 10 years of age. We also get some uh, teenagers, as you heard about um, earlier today. And then we get um, most of the patients between 20 and 30. And when you look at the older adults, you can see the peak is between 50 and 60. So this is what our PIA and our non-PIA cohort looks like. Um, and here we have um, ET patients just to take each part and look at it in a little bit more detail. And you can see that um, there's significant follow-up. And of our patients who present with ET, so mainly platelets being elevated, um, some of them have the JAK2 mutation, uh, some of them have um, the CalR mutation, and some are triple negative. Sometimes they progress to polycythemia, so they might come in with high platelet counts and then over time develop high hemoglobin and red cell counts. Um, and occasionally they can progress to myelofibrosis, but almost never during childhood. That tends to be more of an adult complication. And we don't have any um, ET patients who have gone on to get AML, and, and that's what we're striving for, keeping our patients healthy and um, eliminating the risk for a leukemia. For um, PV patients, um, again, we have uh, most of our patients are girls or young women, as I mentioned earlier. The median age for PV is about 25, but we have a range. Our, the youngest was eight, and the oldest um, was 30 because we cut off the young adults at 30 here. And the median age was about 18. So you already heard from Nicole, most of her patients with PV, I think, are teenage girls, right? Mm-hmm. The kids who are under 12 sort of passes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and there's the PB is almost always associated with JAK2 mutations, and that's true not only in our um, children and young adults, but also in the older patients. Um, and you can see a small percentage of these will progress, and it's usually over many, many, many years, so by the time they get to their 50s or 60s. And again, we're so actively investigating this area because we want to prevent that progression. Um, and here's uh, our MF patients, and um, you can see MF is much more common in older patients. Um, here, only half of the patients with MF were girls. There were only four patients. Their median age at diagnosis was 25. Um, and none of them have progressed to AML, which contrasts um, starkly to the adult and older patients who present with MF. So I think that's really encouraging. There's clearly something different. Our patients are doing much better, and that's what we want to maintain. Um, and then what happens over time? So as I mentioned, we've been following lots of these patients over time. So the left pie charts are divided by disease, ET, PV, and MF and they're divided into girls and boys or males and females. And um, you can see um, in our younger patients, mostly we have ET, the blue is the biggest. And even over time, we still keep a predominance of ET in 
the girls and almost 50% um, of the males over time um, maintain an ET phenotype. In contrast, older patients who present with this progress um, to MF and PV and the bigger chunks of the pie chart are MF um, for our older patients. And then what happens, we talked about how um, the clonal burden can increase, which means that our blood stem cells that are giving rise to our blood, more of them will have the mutation, okay? So a larger percentage of the stem cells will harbor this mutation. So if you take older patients, somebody who was diagnosed in their 50s, that tends to increase with age. Um, What's, I think, very exciting, our younger patients are not really increasing. And let's take a look at um, just the average. This is a little bit messy here, a lot of dots. It's hard to see, whoa, where is that going? So when you take the average, you can see our kids in red are below in terms of the amount of this mutant stem cell. Um, they're much lower than the adults. And that, that red line, it's not going up. So I think that's really exciting. Um, and then what kinds of complications do we see in our younger patients in contrast to our older patients? And this is something that's important to us because we want to prevent that. Um, and one of the things we've noticed um, is that the younger patients tend to have more clots. We're not really sure why that is. Um, and that's something we hope to be able to determine by studying our patients um, and studying their mutations. Um, and it's something that we're... Um, educating our um, gastroenterologists about because we've had a number of young adult patients who present with that clot and icterus, um, and it's an MPN. It's not a liver problem. So our liver teams are getting much more um, aware of the diagnosis and, and comfortable with it. Um, and you already heard about some patients with clot. So we, um, I think, it's very important to know this complication because it can be prevented. One of the things we typically do is we try to maintain the hemoglobins and the matocrits in a normal range. And we found for some of our um, young adult patients when their hemoglobin gets abnormal, they've had um, recurrent clots. So now um, our goal is to keep them in the normal range. And we typically use phlebotomy. Um, sometimes we add other agents like interferon, um, as you saw with Josh, and then more recently we've been using RUX as well. Um, but if we can maintain our patients with phlebotomy, we tend to do that because um, if the patient doesn't need to take a drug, I think that's always advantageous. Um, and um, many of our patients do very, very well with just phlebotomy. And I think some of you mentioned that you keep Excel flow sheets and you record your count. I encourage all of our patients to do that because what it enables us to do is to help you stay as healthy as possible. Because you, what we ask our patients to do who can do it or their parents um, is to keep the flow sheet and record symptoms. Because some of our patients, you know, in general for patients who are full grown, a full grown um, adolescent or young adult um, female will like to keep 42% and below. But if I had a patient who said, every time I get to be 40, I'm getting terrible headaches, well, then we would pick that as their goal. We try to really personalize our therapy. And you know yourself better. You know your child better than I would because I don't get to see you as often. So I really want this to be a team approach. I want you to tell me when you feel best. And then we'll monitor your levels and keep you where you feel best. And this can change over time because, as you probably know, when your child's born, hemoglobin levels levels tend to be lower. As you get bigger, they tend to get higher. Um, boys and men tend to have higher hemoglobins and hematocrits than girls and women. And so we have different goals for boys and men and girls and women. And each patient is different. So if my patient, you know, our usual goal for men is 45. If my patient had headaches and didn't feel good and felt better at 42, we would go lower. So, so it's very much a team approach. Um, you heard about the thromboses. Then you can see a few um, complications that sound like older folk complications, and they are. None of these happen to our children, like a stroke, TIA, which is sort of a transient ischemic attack, um, or a heart attack. These were all in older patients. So we, we diagnosed them and followed them as children, and these things happen when they're older. Okay, and now I think I'm just going to close with a couple, if there's time, a couple words about some of the research that I'm doing um, in the laboratory to try to figure out 
why MPNs progress when they do and how we can stop that. So I study actually a, a gene that's called HMGA and it's a stem cell gene. So it's a gene that makes this protein that I've drawn on the bottom. And what it does is it takes our chromatin, which is sort of like spaghetti in the middle of a cell, and it opens it up. So it kind of unravels the spaghetti and it tells the cell to turn on certain genes. Um, and one of the things we've discovered with this gene is it's telling the cells to grow rapidly and to act like a stem cell. And in fact, it's very high in stem cells. And one of the things that we know about this gene is it can cause cancer. Like if you put it in a blood cell, you put it in a little dish and you watch how it grows. When they form those big, puffy, cloud-like structures, it's growing like a cancer cell. And so we want to know how that's happening and how we can stop it. We also have mice. We have mice with PV, believe it or not. We have mice with PV that can go on and get leukemia. And so we can use these models to try to figure out how it happens and how we can prevent it. And I mentioned this is a stem cell protein. It tells our stem cells to grow and divide. We even have stem cells in our intestines, and that's a picture of that. Um, and we know in mouse models, this gene family is really important in making the red cells um, produce at a higher rate than necessary. So that was one of our first clues that this could be involved in MPNs. And I'd been studying this gene and protein for a very long time, um, even before I started taking care of NPN patients. And so with our huge cohort, we begun to look at our patients. So where is the level of this gene? And there's, they're kind of two family members, sort of brother and sister. Where are these brothers and sisters when we look at the disease phenotype? So if we look at controlled blood stem cells, it's quite low. If we look at PV, it goes up a little bit. MF, it goes up even higher, and AML, it goes up really high. So that's why one of the reasons we're particularly focused on what we can do to block this from going up in our patients. Um, and we know other mutations that our patients get as they grow older can also crank up levels of this gene. And so we've taken some actual leukemia um, cells from older folks who had leukemia in the setting of MPN. So these are people 60s, 70s, 80s. And when we block this gene family, both either the brother or the sister, you block their function, the cells stop growing. So that's pretty exciting to us. We don't want leukemia cells to grow, so this is a good result. And we can also put them in, look for that little cloud-like structure growth in a dish. Um, and so um, we also want to see what happens in a living organism, and so we use mice a lot to study leukemia and to study MPN. And so we've taken these leukemia cells and we put them in a mouse after shutting off our gene family, the brother or the sister, and one of the remarkable things we learned, these are leukemia cells in the blood of the mice. These mice, the ones treated with knocking down the brother and sister gene, never developed leukemia. So we were really excited about that. And I know some of you asked, well, what about other genes? What's going on? And I, I just want to reassure you that many of us are actively investigating the stem cells. We're looking for what the genes are that get turned on. How can we block them? What can we do to keep our patients healthy? Um, and we even have a mouse model that gets leukemia when it's a baby. Now, fortunately, um, our MPN patients, that never happens. Um, but it's a good model because we figure this is really a revved up MPN. So if we can cure leukemia in this mouse, I think we'll have really important insight for our patients. Um, and I just want to show you some exciting results. We took um, a mouse that got rid of its um, HMGA gene, and the mice are surviving like three times as long. And this is sort of um, a really accelerated disease. It's not what our MPN patients get. It's like the, you know, hundredfold more aggressive. But we're really excited because if we can take this super duper MPN that turns into leukemia at three weeks of age and we can block it and really prolong the life of our mice, we're hopeful that we can learn what's happening in the blood stem cells of our patients and prevent this process from happening when our patients are 70 or 80. Um, so this is just a little bit of a summary. Our gene, like I said, it's a stem cell gene. It unravels the spaghetti within our nucleus, and it turns on genes. And you want to have cells that are rapidly growing when you're an embryo, right? You have to start out as a single cell and grow into a person. So that kind of process is important for normal cells and normal stem cells. And if you're a blood stem cell, you actually need the capability to grow and divide because you've got to make blood from the time a person is born till the time that they're, they die. And hopefully that's about 100 years old. So you've got a big job ahead of you. You need these genes to be turned on. But you want them to be very precisely regulated. And we found 
found that when JAK2 gets cranked up and mutated, some of these other genes are getting turned on. And so what we're trying to do is prevent that turning on and causing leukemia. And we're starting to dissect um, genes and other pathways that are turning on this gene. And we want to take what we learn in the laboratory back to our children and young adults and older adults and really keep them healthy. So I know lots of you were interested. What else is going on? Are we looking? And we, we most certainly are. And as Nicole mentioned, we're very much a team. We put our patients together. We collect samples together. We think together because really, just like you, we want to keep everyone um, with an MPN healthy. We want to keep them healthy if they're diagnosed when they're a week old or diagnosed when they're 50 years old. Um, and so just in conclusion from our cohort, what we've learned is that um, of our entire cohort, I think it's pretty amazing. Over 10% of the patients are actually children or young adults, you know? So it's not really an insignificant number at all. Um, and there's more girls than boys. Um, ET is most common and PV is most common. And I think that's really good news because they tend to be relatively mild. And as you saw from our little um, graph of the MF patients, even our MF patients are doing well. So there's clearly something different about the children and um, their disease course. They also um, have lower levels of the mutant gene, and they're taking a much longer time to progress. And in fact, you saw from that, those little red dots, those levels actually are not going up. So I think that's really exciting. We do know, um, just from looking very carefully at the histories of our patients, our young patients are getting more clots. And that's really important. So it translates to how we manage our patients. So our patients with PV, as I mentioned, for most um, adolescent, older adolescent girls and young women, we keep their hem hematocrits at 42 and below. For most young men, 45 and below. And that's what we used for Josh, um, and that's, um, those are the kind of levels we use. Unless you tell me that you feel better when you're at a certain level, and then we work with you and, and we try to adjust our goals, because every patient's different. And these numbers certainly are okay once you're fully grown, but they're not okay for a younger child, too. So this kind of data sharing is really important. We find out what complications are, and we find out what's the best way to manage our patients. And in fact, Nicole was asking me about one of her patients, and what I'm gonna do is go back home and see, well, if our patients with this mutation, you know, how long, what happened to them over 70 years. And then I can go back and say, hey, Nicole, this patient did great. We really don't have to worry about this. Or we can say, this patient's progressed. Let's take a more aggressive approach. So, so it's really helpful, as you know, for rare disorders to just put your heads together. And you know that means all around the world. Um, and that's one of the reasons we like to go to meetings like our um, American Hematology Society, where I met Nicole. People come from all over the world and, and share data, because we really want to keep our patients healthy. Um, and so our general approach um, to treating children and young adults and even older adults is to um, administer care that controls the symptoms. We want to prevent those clots. We want to prevent the headaches. We want you to feel good. And we do try to limit therapy that can be potentially toxic. Um, I think the interferon is really exciting because there have been some reports of remission, so actual cures. Um, and so um, we've been treating some of our patients with interferon it, when they can tolerate it. As you saw, that didn't work so well with Josh. Um, and um, we also are using some of the newer agents on our patients. And we're keeping a really open mind and hoping to continue to advance the field. So I just want to um, let you know what our future goals are. That is to um, keep um, diagnosing more children, seeing more children, getting them enrolled in our studies so we can see what the mutations are, how they're changing over time, and how they're doing, and what are the successful treatment approaches. Um, we want to understand um, what we call the molecular underpinnings. So what happens to those signaling molecules, those proteins that talk to each other and tell the cells to make too much blood? What's happening to them over time? Who else is joining in on this conversation in the cells and causing a problem? And how can we block those um, proteins from making too much blood. And it's really an exciting era as a physician and a scientist because technology has really um, advanced significantly. We can you know, sequence the entire genome of a cell and we can find out what's mutated. And I think that's going to really shed some light on what happens with our patients. And what we hope is to be able to find some things that predict for patients who might progress rapidly, some things that predict for a patient who's going to live to 100 and not need anything. And because that would be helpful. 
Um, we wouldn't want to be aggressive and use a therapy that could be toxic if it's your pro your disease isn't going to affect your lifespan and your your healthy um, survival into adult adulthood. I mean, we want to prevent disease progression, as I mentioned. Um, and our real goal is to cure it, to get rid of these abnormal clones. And I think that's definitely reachable um, in something that um, we probably can attain sometime in the next decade. So this is what we want, healthy childhood, healthy adults. And I want to thank all the people that um, helped me work on this problem. Those are some of the members of my lab who have been working on the MPN project. There are even more now. This is a little bit of an old slide. You heard about Dr. Um, Moliterno and Spivak, and they've been running this program even before them, actually. There was a man, Dr. Locke Conley, who was really a pioneer in the field. Um, who followed patients from the time he was 30 to the, about the time he was 90. And then Jerry, he is actually in his 80s. He's still seeing patients, and so he's been following patients you know, for f over 50 years. And Allison um, has been following many of these patients too. So we put our heads together, you know? Um, they have a wealth of knowledge about patients and how they've done, and I have a little more experience with children than they do, so together we really make a good team. And I'm thrilled, you know, as I mentioned, that Nicole and, and she's identifying and lining up colleagues all over the country and world that are interested in this so that we can bring our knowledge to help our patients. And of course, you all here are the reason that we're doing what we do, so thank you very much. Thank you.